on this week's episode of Talkstone. HET Bueno series and an update on the Hearthstone Global Games. Our guest this week, Alex Charsky, product manager for Hearthstone Esports, joins us to chat about the upcoming HET Fall Playoffs. And as always, we bring this week's well-played moment, meme history, and my favorite question, Dan, would you buy this deck? Everybody get in here. Let's break down all the esports action. Welcome to Talkstone, your premier source for competitive Hearthstone news and analysis. My name is Frodan, and if you guys couldn't tell from his voice, Mr. Sanders, who is now officially the proud owner of a, a new of baby. a new car, no. <laughs> a baby. That's right. Uh, is back in the studio with us this week. TJ, what's up, man? How are you doing? I'm a little tired, but overall good. Uh, it's it's been a really exciting uh, past couple weeks. Uh, I got to watch the last episode of Talkstone with a baby in my arms. It was pretty cool. Yeah? The ba- so the baby was watching too? Yeah. Uh, he's uh, he's already in training. Okay. Every- you got him a separate tablet? Yeah. Every time practicing. Every time I ladder up, mm-hmm. I let him click for the last lethal. Ooh. Wow. Interesting. Very uh, strong cognitive abilities at two days old. <laughs> He's, uh, he's uh, impressive. He's more than two weeks old now. By the time this episode airs, he'll be almost three weeks. That's crazy. That's yeah. awesome. His I'm skills really are limited right now, but uh, <laughs> he's really good at pooping. That's uh, that's one of his biggest skills. Uh, me too. Yeah. Yeah, we have a lot in common. Yeah, he takes after his father in that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, TJ, uh, we missed you. It's glad- It's good to have you back. It felt a little lonely in the studio without you. Um, and we got a lot of stuff to talk about this week. We got HT Buenos Aires, we got HGG, we got upcoming fall playoffs. Uh, we mentioned Alex Charsky is going to be in the studio uh, to chat, and it's always cool because we don't really get too much, um, you know, access to some of these yeah. people behind the scenes in Hearthstone. So, you know, having Che on was great, having Drew on was great. Of course, different perspectives, and of course, I want to get Alex's perspective on what it's like running tour stops and whatnot. Of course, playoffs. And it's really cool because we'll dive into it a bit later, but <laughs> playoffs is one of the biggest endeavors that Hearthstone Esports makes, it's really tough to yeah. coordinate that many players across that many locations yeah. I, I might remotely. Be, I might be ignorant for saying this, but I think it's one of the largest undertakings in the entire industry <laughs> yeah. in terms of how much uh, actual coordination goes on for the length and duration that it is, which is three weeks. Plus, we have to coordinate with what's ch- happening in China as well. Yeah, uh, It's chaos, but of course, we'll, we'll get to that um, in time when Alex joins us. In the meantime, we're going to start things off with HCT Buenos Aires for our first Mana Crystal, TJ. <laughs> Ping! <laughs> so, with uh, HCT Buenos Aires, you missed me, TJ. Say it. I did, I okay. did. All right, I, I, haven't had much, <laughs> I haven't had much, like, actual human interaction in the past couple weeks outside of my right, wife and doctors. Okay. So, and, and the spawn yeah. that came out of her. <laughs> yeah. So for, forgive me if I'm like a little bit slow on formulating words sure. because I haven't had to use words a lot in yeah. the past couple weeks. Um, but I'll get there. That's okay. Using words isn't really important for your job. Anyways. <laughs> so, uh, you know, for ACT Buenos Aires, this was the first official tour stop for Season 3 and started off with a familiar site with the Copa America region mm-hmm. um, being hosted there in Argentina. Uh, Lee from the USA was able to take it against Masanto in the finals uh, from Canada. Mm-hmm. And, of course, rounding out the top four, Cosmo and Muzzy. Muzzy yet again getting a, a really deep run. Don't want to focus too much on just Muzzy because I feel like we talked yeah. about him. Uh, almost, you know, I know him a little bit, even though he's definitely a player that people are always paying attention to, and rightfully so. There's a reason why we talk about him that much, because he keeps making it up there. Sure, sure. But, I mean, just look at the rest of the top eight. Uh, we have Team America, <laughs> yeah. uh, who represents USA. Really fun to see him show a little bit of pride there. Uh, we also have Quonet and uh, Race, two players that we often see end the Hearthstone Championship Tour, whether playoffs or tour stops, make deep runs. Uh, cool again wants to see, to see that consistency, not just from, of course, the people who we always talk about, like Hunter Race and Muzzy, but yeah. also for some of these other guys. Yeah, if we take a step back, just the full 16 that competed mm-hmm. uh, in the event, it was a pretty stacked field. It was a qualifying event, so uh, you know we had online qualifiers that uh, put 16 players that actually got to travel to Buenos Aires and, and play in the event. And even players like Chunsu, who we touted right. as being one of the best Hearthstone players ever, who played on the BlizzCon stage in 2015, making some crazy plays. He was very quiet, qualified again. Uh, you have Lucas, who's a Brazilian player, who a lot of players talk about when they talk about uh, strong Brazilian players that don't make, that haven't had that 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 big come up. 
Swids is always there. PNC. Um, Topo Pablo was yeah. there. Uh, and his hair. It was lit. On point. It was on point. On and point. Vigiac was also in the top 16. Yep. Um, Perna. Perna, who's race's practice partner, mm-hmm. also a member from just – that in general, Latin America, a really strong player. A lot of great players in these top 16s. And I think one thing that HCT has you know, very much successfully accomplished in all of these tour stops is that the, the, the players who are excellent can prove themselves mm-hmm. over time. And I think you know, there's very little ability for people to argue that these players that get here don't deserve to be there. Um, and, of course, what's also cool is seeing some of the players challenge that, right? Like Lee being able to win – but, you know, I was actually mistaken in believing that Lee was a player that we haven't really seen before because TJ reminded me about something that happened a few years ago. So I have brought with me, uh, there's not much on these, but I thought I'd bring them just because I thought it was cool. My eSports notebooks. I'm going to show them books. real quick. Dang. Well, I ran out of space in one. Uh, it's hard to see, but there's a lot of writing on it. It's really bright. Um, when I use, I, I still bring eSports notebooks, but they're much less in depth when mm-hmm. i first started casting hearthstone i wasn't that great i didn't have a good memory for the game i wasn't a good card game player yet so i had to write down everything in order to make sure that i could remember it and speak to it intelligently and uh i i was looking at lee and he was on my friends list from a long time ago i had him added on skype and i was like this is weird i don't remember this guy but he actually played in legendary series Season well, he played in season one and two, which is an event that Dane and I cast for yeah. ESL f- four years four ago. Four years ago, yeah, uh, a very long time ago. The first event that I cast with Dan back when we almost cast with each other exclusively for like a year. Um, and I was looking through my notebooks, and I found this. Lee actually used to go by Limujix. I asked him how he pronounced his name. He didn't even know. It's basically like an anagram. <laughs> his name is Jim Lou. It's an anagram of his name with an X at the end. Sure. And he eventually changed it. No surprise. <laughs> Lee is much easier, much to, easier. to say. Uh, but he actually competed. In, he qualified for a week of Legendary Series, which was like an open qualifier, and played in a top eight of that event that we cast under a different name. So we have seen him before. It's just yeah, been a while. Just, I didn't know. He, he, yeah. he kind of went through a little bit of a, a brand change, if you will. And l- l- listen to the players that competed in that week. Oskaka, Amaz, Tom60229, Caldi. You remember Caldi? Oh wow! Yeah, he became a a, a coach. Yeah, in, for Tempo Store. He did. He played he went on to the school. He played on like Fanatic, I think, for yep. a while uh, as well. Um, so like a pretty cool, you know, journey back in time. But we have seen Lee before. It was just in a weird four year ago period, and he's been quiet yeah. since then. And I, and I think that's uh, also a really interesting perspective for um, HCT in general, or just Hearthstone as a competitive outlet for people. You. Don't always have to commit 24-7, make it your lifestyle. We have people who have jobs and balance it. And then we have people who are able to just walk away, take a, a, a important period of their life to maybe finish graduate school. Or maybe they're having a child you know, for the first time. They can't dedicate as much time to practice. Then they come back you know, years down the road, two years, three years later. And you know, it takes a little bit of time to assimilate back, but they can get right back into stride. And I yeah. think that's one thing that's beautiful about the game, which is a lot more difficult in other games where mechanics and your reflexes and your response time is always going to be tested at every angle and you have to balance that on top of being you know uh you know have a good grip on strategy and the preparation and all the better stuff yeah uh, and you know that's a that's a great point and i think uh, lee was a testament to that and uh well i'll get into his deck list in a second but i want to talk about since it was uh sort of you know the first big event after boom's day uh that had you know hgt stakes on the line um, the deck breakdown. So Druid was, of course, well, I'll start off by saying all nine classes were represented among the 16-player field. Uh, Mage with only one, Chime with only two, Priest with only two. Uh, but uh, Druid, Hunter, Rogue, and Warlock uh, were the top four mm-hmm. archetypes, which I think was to be expected. This is the yeah. second set in a rotation. So a lot of times the first deck that players gravitate to are old good decks just with a few new cards implemented in them. So, you know, we're talking about even Warlock, Control Warlock, uh, Odd Rogue, uh, Death Rattle Hunter, uh, like Katrina Cube Hunter got, you know, um, the Spider Bomb, which was a good uh, inclusion to the deck to give them a little bit more early removal. And then, of course, Druid, uh, which was the most represented. Ooh, just Druid. Uh, but I'd like to talk about Lee's lineup uh, since he did win the event. Um, and Lee, I think he played pretty solidly overall over the course of, or the, course of yeah, the week. Yeah, I'd say so. Uh, he didn't have any of these crazy plays, but the decks that he was 
uh, piloting weren't decks that you need to make crazy plays with. He was playing a Control Warlock with double Demonic Project. Uh, he was playing the Malagos Druid, a Recruit Death Rattle Hunter with eggs and um, and Katrina. And then uh, his final deck, the Odd Warrior. That was the deck that I think he stood out on the most. The other decks, he kind of just made good reads on the meta, brought strong decks that had really good counters across the, the, the entire event, uh, and played solidly. Not fantastically, but solidly. Yeah, and a lot of times that's really what needs to be done. Like yeah. at, at the end of the day, uh, bringing good decks and playing well is what players really focus on. Yeah. And I think Lee did exactly that. I think Odd Warrior is still a little bit of an, uh, an unconventional pick at the time, a couple weeks ago, yeah. for the metagame. So I think that's a great read. And because there's a lot of aggressive decks out there, you, people talk about Odd Rogue and maybe the Zoo Warlocks that are coming out. And then you have a, a few other things like Token Druid, Even Shaman, Odd Paladin, you know, kind of making the, the rounds uh, around ladder. If you guys yep. are struggling against the aggressive lineups, try that Odd Warrior. Yeah. HCT Buenos Aires was pretty cool. It was. You should go back and watch it. Lots of great moments. And, uh, you know, just a little bit of a spoiler for people. Our well-played moments also from HCT Buenos Aires. But before we talk about that, we will also uh, talk about some other programs that's happening around the mm -hmm. Hearthstone ecosystem. And that's HGG. Over with our boys across the pond. Uh, we have three teams that's already qualified for the round of 16 with undefeated records. Uh, with Ukraine, uh, no surprises, they made it really deep last year. Uh, Brazil, who's kind of just been on the come up in recent times uh, as kind of the spearhead of Latin America's surgeons yeah. in Hearthstone esports. And then China, finally been able to put on a performance for people to remember so far. You know, it's obviously we have a lot more Hearthstone to play in HGG, but being 4 0 undefeated, definitely something that China's been looking for because it feels like the community has so much sense of pride, but they haven't been able to have like these big, huge W's outside of maybe the Wild Open. Yeah, they were able to grab a couple months back. And I think this is a result of uh, last year in the 2017 uh, HGG China. It it just didn't seem like they took it seriously every week, and I think that came back to bite them a little bit. The community wasn't wasn't very happy with them, and this year they've really stepped it up. And we all know that China has great players. Yeah, right. For sure, for sure. Uh, maybe not as represented at the World Championship last year, but there's a reason why we kept seeing the same names. Was because they're really good. Yeah. So uh, no surprise. Uh, to see them. And also, Dan, we have a lot of teams that are eliminated. I'm not going to run through the, the full list here, um, but it's 15 teams now that have that three yeah. losses, uh, which means they cannot move on to the to the round of 16, which is the next phase of HGG. Uh, so it's starting to get thinner now uh, That's with, right. with the teams. But I still think all sort of the teams that you expect to be front runners that have you know that star power players – are up there. But there are a few on the cusp. There are a few that are floating around that 2-2 record that have some big matches coming up. Oh, yeah. Uh, talking about Romania with RDU. The U.S., which everybody was saying had one of the most stacked lineups of players everywhere. Right. Canada, uh, which I thought had a great uh, a great team. And Japan, uh, all at 2-2, two and two, all with big matches coming up this week. How about Germany? Germany as well, yeah. They're, they're, they're also two they're, two. they're up there. I'd yeah. Gloss over them. Germany has you know one of the, the strongest teams. Even If you just look at points, mm -hmm. like total points accumulated, uh, Germany is, is very much up there uh, in uh, just points strength of players. So a lot of big matchups coming up uh, this week uh, for, for HGG. So that's something I'm going to uh, definitely be keeping my eye on as I prep for playoffs. Yeah, and some of the competition is really, really close. It even comes down to the smallest of edges. I, I think the, the game that stood out to me quite possibly the most was uh, Italy versus the Netherlands, where it felt like Italy was just going to win 3-1. Turno was like playing really well, accounting for every possibility, playing to every single out, and then uh, specifically Quest Rogue just pulled it out of nowhere, like right out of the hat, barely able to survive, and then they went up to uh, win the Series 3-2 because of that. They tied up the Series and won 3-2. Mm -hmm. Things like that makes it very dramatic, and it's fun, too, because you get to see the players really expressive. I've never seen Turner so upset before, ever. Yeah. So it was just it was kind of like a, a Sinto lull moment, in a way. It was really funny. Also kind of heartbreaking on his behalf. But I think if Italy and, and other these underdog countries keep playing like that, yeah. as good as they can, I think it's going to be a really cool photo finish. And what was funny about that, too, is Theo was interviewed on the HG Community Show uh, before the matches last week, mm -hmm. and he was asked to you know run down the players on his team and and what their strengths were, 
and he said, oh, we have Tyler, so we are going to be fantastic <laughs> with Quest Rogue. And so it's funny that that's, that's how, how it worked that's out. That's how exactly. it ended up. So. By the hair of their chinny chins. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely pay attention to, like, who's dominating, of course. But, I mean, with each week passing, people are getting eliminated. And yes. it's starting to get really scary. And, of course, that top 16 cutoff uh, right now doesn't have some of the most powerhouse teams that you expect to do well. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of like some of the things about these team competitive events in Hearthstone. You never know who's going to come out on top. It's very hard to guarantee success. And some of these teams are also bringing out wacky lineups, man. We talk about the the, the HGG decks, the, the Egg Paladin, Egg Cube Control Paladin from Russia. They didn't play it, but it's just interesting that they're bringing that to the, to the table, man. Yeah. Mech Combo Priest. You know, bringing out some of these like upgradable frame graphs with Bronze Gatekeeper, maybe some incorporating a Lyra in there so you can have like a miracle aspect. So it's like a miracle combo mech piece. Some of these really cool decks are out there in HGG. Definitely go check it out. It's been some of the most fun Hearthstone I've watched so, so yeah. far. Yeah, Czech Republic last year pretty much won the whole thing with creative deck building. Yeah, in a team format with small edges. <laughs> uh, so uh, pretty cool to watch, and especially with new set. It's still pretty new. You know, a yeah. couple weeks. Uh, definitely a cool tournament right. to to stay tuned to. Yeah, and we don't have uh, too much more to cover, but they're they're also doing community shows and like recapping everything with Falcone and crew. So uh, we had him last week on the show, and he was talking about some of the shows that they're doing. So if you guys want to know more about HGG, make sure to check out some of that content out there. Because uh, I mean, we don't want to just step on their their territory and just tell you guys everything about HGG. Yeah, give them something to talk about, right, TJ? Yep, that's right. All right, so now it's time for the well-played moment, TJ. And this week, I'm glad you're here because uh, this one is a triple-decker. We got uh, so many well-played moments in this one game Yes. that we're not going to do well-played moments for the next three episodes. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> no, it's not. But just find out and watch. Uh, so this one is picked up by you, um, mm -hmm. courtesy of our boys who were able to cast uh, HTT Burner. So shout-out to Derek and Lorinda and, and crew. Uh, Fung versus Lee in the group stage. For day number two, yep. with Warlock versus Druid. Why is this the case, DJ? So, uh, Lee was playing Control Warlock with Double Demonic Project, mm -hmm. um, and Fung was playing Malagos Druid. Yes. Lee, of course, have ha was having a lot of success with this matchup, particularly, of course, because of Malagos Druid was the most represented deck. Yeah, and it's and good against Control Warlock. Yeah. Assuming things don't go disastrously for long yeah. with the Demonic Project and the Twig being snapped by weapon removal. Yeah, but a lot of times you have to find creative ways to win because your Malagos may get Demonic Project, you ha may have your Twig removed, there's a lot of healing control Warlock. Sure, sure. Uh, you're kind of racing against the clock yeah. a little bit. Uh, Fung had a very awkward early hand. Yeah. Um, you know, he had a little bit of ramp, but he had double UI, a couple of Moonfires, mm -hmm. Alex Straws and Nourish. He had a full hand, he couldn't UI because he would have overdrawn Malagos, so an awkward situation. Uh, he draws Malagos, or sorry, Alex Straza. So this is the first part. This is... Part number one. This was well-played moment, part 1A. Um, and he, so he plays Alex Straza, brings his opponent down to 15. Next turn, Lee heals up a little bit. Fung floops his Alex Straza and swipes his opponent in the face to bring him down right. to 12. Instead of saving the floop like most people like me would do. For the Malagos. For the Malagos. Yeah, to be able to get that additional so burst. So Alex is again after yes. Lee burns his healing. Yes. Okay. Now, this brings him down to 12, which is the break point for Malagos Double Moonfire. So yep. that signals to Lee, oh, no. He's got Malagos Double Moonfire's hand. I don't have a healing. I have to go for a Demonic Project right now or else I'm going to die. But Fung didn't have any minions in hand. Fung played Goodness. him like a fiddle. That's right. And Lee plays Demonic Project, only hits his own minion. Fung sees the ooze Demonic Project, so could, could wait for a twig win condition. But instead, he realizes that he can put... Lee in a checkmate situation with Malagos in hand. He had Malagos double Moonfire, but Lee was at 15 health. He had Swipe in hand, so you, you, you're thinking to yourself, well, I can play Malagos, but I can't kill him, and I don't have Floop, and my burn is limited. Right. So w what do I have to do? But he realized, wait, if I play Malagos and double Moonfire in the face now, I put him to three, he can't heal and kill my Malagos at the same time because he'd been hand tracking. There was only one Siphon Soul that was used. But for Gul'dan, if he had played it, would have left up the Malagos, allowing him to ultimate infestation for 10, because he would have been, or yeah, he would have been at 8 at that point. So he just plays the Malagos, puts him to 3. It's a checkmate situation. That's right. Realizes that, doesn't need any other tools, and Fung just played that one really funging good. <laughs> it's, it's everything that you kind of want from a payoff in a game of Hearthstone. There's risk management, there's uh, calculations and reads that you're making on your opponent. And, of course, being able to win in an unconventional, creative way, which mm -hmm. is trying to use Malagos without, like, while pressing the end turn button. 
I, there's, I can't tell you how many times where Malagos hits the board and the end turn button doesn't get hit because the game's over and decided yeah. by then. But realizing just the threat of a 412 plus a follow-up spell of going very deep into fatigue, using it as the final option, it was fantastically played and well thought of, and that is why it is the well-played vote. All right, Dan, and now it's time for Meme History. And this week, this one is one that I hold near and dear to my heart. Uh, reason being because this meme originated in my very first BlizzCon. It was the first time I'd ever cast. Uh, BlizzCon the first time I ever cast World Championship. So uh, the first World time you ever went to BlizzCon, too? Yes. First wow. time, yeah. So uh, it was really cool. Um, it is Paveling Book. Ooh, this is a good one. This yes. is a good one. So Paveling Book uh, references in the quarterfinals of the World Championship in 2015, Pavel versus Amnesiac. Amnesiac had a big lead in the series. The only deck he needed to win with was his Druid. Malagos Druid. Malagos <laughs> Druid. By the way. <laughs> Funnily enough. Yeah, this is actually a great transition. I'm pretty sure he was 3-0 up at this point. Uh, it was because it was best of seven. Ahead. It was best he of was seven. very hard ahead. And Pavel was in a situation where he was staring down a threat that he would have lost the game to. The yes. only way he could win is if he drew some way to remove this threat. This Malagos. It was straight up Malagos on the board, DJ. Was it? Yes. Go okay. back and watch it. I'll, I'll, I'll trust you. There was Malagos on the board, and once again, uh, you know, the predecessor to the well-played moment with Fung playing Malagos for te- uh, you know on the board for Tempo and trying to use it to threaten – I mean, Amnesiac did the same thing. And this is, if he wins one more game, he's due to the semifinals, and history would be completely rewritten. In some parallel universe, Amnesiac's ego somehow got bigger by winning the 2016 World Championship, and he went on to just be actually Hearthstone's biggest star ever. But uh, no, instead, Pavel uh, draws the babbling book and then lands babbling book into a polymorph to shut down the Malagos, which was his only way he can deal with it because he was playing a tempo mage. How yeah. else do you remove a 412 minion that just literally kills everything you ever play? Yeah. And from that point on, history in Hearthstone was rewritten. And I think, you know, very uh, commonly, Pavel even makes fun of himself, getting, calling it the Pavling books. Like, yeah, it's, that's just what I'm, that's just, that's my card. Yeah, it was, it was Malagos. And it was, it was actually 3 2 in the series. So not as close, yes. but uh, Pavel did go on to win it. Uh, and of course, Amnesiac will will never forget that moment. Uh, he showed some yeah. resilience. If, if he, of forgets, he came back. if he forgets TJ, we won't let him. Forget. We'll remind him yeah. by putting it on <laughs> meme history. That's what it's for. Uh, but what this also did was made a trend of kind of you know attaching these I- identities uh, of cards to certain players uh, when bad things happen. Uh, the other one we talked about was uh, now we don an old boy at the summer championship of yeah. 2017. Uh, with the Dirty Rats. Ooh, the Dirty Rats and the Doomsayers. The Dirty Rats and the Doomsayers. Yeah, really brutal. Uh, and, the, you know, th- these kinds of, uh, you know, cards being tied to players have been a long-standing tradition. You have, you know, Amaz and Ragnaros, and you have Raynad and Knife Juggler. Yep. So, you know, it's it's definitely a really fun, uh, you know, part of competing. You just When you do it and you put yourself out there, sometimes you just get tied to the identity of a card. Uh, for Specifically, though, people look at, Whenever a random mage spell is being generated and you get, like, a polymorph for, like, the exact removal, people in chat will be spamming Pavel or someone will be talking about, like, Pavel, is that you on social media? That's where it's from. We hope this edition of Meme History made the Hearthstone community a more inclusive place for all. All right, so now uh, all the, the fun and jokes. The real serious biz is about to begin, TJ, because fall playoffs are upon us. At the time of this recording, actually, it's just going to come out this week. Uh, This weekend is the fall playoff kickoff, starting with Europe, and then we go all across the world to find out who's going to the fall championships and ultimately who's going to the world championships uh, at the end of the 2018 campaign. So, TJ, let's talk all about fall playoffs. Uh, What are some of the things you're looking forward to? Just, you know, maybe either – thematically or maybe about the expansion or maybe certain players what, what, what sticks out to you man I, I just want to start off by saying I love playoff season you know er, ever since I started casting Hearthstone there's something about playoffs that gets me even more excited than even like a world championship because you have so many players going in and dreams get crushed Dan <laughs> especially when we go into <laughs> the last what playoffs. you enjoy the most I, I do I do like seeing you know uh, players who've been trying for a long time 
Uh, I liked the last playoff story of Kinlan all day. You know how excited I was. Uh, hashtag Yoked. Um, but uh, I am looking forward to this one because we are pretty soon after an, an expansion release. And we the meta, I don't think, is entirely flushed out. Of course, it's not a rotation uh, like it was in, in the last playoffs. It's not as big of a change as it was since we're still seeing a lot of the same Tier 1 decks. Right. But I'm really excited to see how cohesive lineups are formed mm -hmm. for playoffs because we've seen people just kind of throwing stuff together, putting popular decks and just adding giggling inventors to them and hit and play. But I'm looking forward to seeing cohesive lineups. Uh, looking forward to seeing since we've uh, basically the top legend has been Quest Rogue and like counters to Quest Rogue for mm -hmm. you know the past couple days or past past week, you know what players come up with. So that's that's the thing I'm looking forward to the most. Um, but Europe is, I feel like Europe always plays it safer, but I don't bull call bull prediction. Okay, Europe's not going to play it safe. A lot really? of players in Europe are going to take very big risks in full counter lineups. For I, playoffs. I think that uh, Europe is going to be a little bit of a mix of everything. I think that's why a lot of people enjoy watching them. Not only do they kind of kick it off, and Europe um, is, is a really popular and one of the most competitive, if not the most competitive region. You have, what, 80-some people that is qualified through points. Yeah. 39 was the 39. point cutoff, which would put you top 20 in almost every other region guaranteed. Yeah, it, It's so cutthroat and competitive in there, and you have so many players who missed it that we've come to expect to make it. Orange isn't in there. Crane isn't in there. Janetsky, who's been made deep run, Shane Dachi's not making in there. Even Dr. Boom himself at 22 points is not in playoffs. 24 points. He missed. Yeah. Oh. It's tough, man. So Europe is just kind of where, like, the you know, it's not necessarily the most uh, high stakes, but it feels like that. Yeah. And uh, that's why you do see a lot of players be conservative sometimes with what is tried and true. It's like you said, what's the meta going to be? Is it going to be people who just kind of know the, 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 the safe test stuff, like Giggling Inventor plus, you know, a couple of good mechs that you might go in your decks? Or people are going to do what some other people have been doing, like Muzzy, which is take a, Bring a new archetype class and just surprise people. Yeah. And one thing that's also very important about playoffs to know, at least from the caster's perspective and why we're excited, is because we finally start to see um, actual think tanks and boot camps really develop in competitive Hearthstone to the point where people aren't willingly sharing some of this information until the playoffs have been determined. Yeah. So when people post the deck lists, they've been preparing for this for weeks. You hear the Germans, for, for example, they've been boot camping, kind of calling each other three, four weeks in advance. The meta, the, the expansion just came out, and they're already starting to say, like, let's prepare for playoffs. Any secrets that we find and, and any important tech, we're keeping it to ourselves unless you qualify for a tour stop. And even then, you know, we'll, we'll figure out a way to beat that. Yeah. So I'm excited to see what people have been keeping under the wraps, if anything, you know. And that's kind of what's exciting. We didn't really have too much of that in the past because people were just kind of free-flowing, sharing information. But every year, you know, it gets more and more intense and everyone's trying to find their edges. So now the practice groups are kind of keeping some things close to their chests. I can't wait for that to bust out in these fall playoffs here. I think also team standings has sort of exacerbated that a little bit. People sure. got, people got a taste of it. You know, maybe in the first season of team standings, people didn't realize, you know, how big of a thing that it, it could be, right? Yeah. Well, if they watched the tour, TJ, which we're not supposed to go to the promo for another five minutes, but if they do watch that, they will know. That's a promo of a promo. That's a promo of a promo yeah. for the promo. But it, it is a big deal, you know, um, being able to call yourself, like, the best team in Hearthstone. Yeah. And so having a practice group within your team and then not sharing information outside of that circle also has implications yeah. for team standings because playoffs and championships, which goes along with it, have a big chunk of points, yeah. which could put you in the lead. So if you have two teammates that qualify yeah. for uh, the championship, then you're, you're sitting pretty. So um, I, that's... One of the reasons why I like playoffs the most, the next reason is, of, is, of course, the stories of the players. I think the big question mark for this one is is Hunter Ace. We talk about him a lot, but we talk about him in the context of tour stops. We talk about him in the context of earning points, ladder finishes. But where's his HCT performances outside of tour stops? Where's his playoffs and his championship he's performances? Had one, he's had one playoffs, TJ. Come on. He's had more than that. He's had some last year, too. He okay. Just, he, just, but he doesn't since, have a history. Since his you know rise to stardom, because yeah. I think he is the hottest player in Hearthstone. So hot right I'm now. I'm just going to let you guys interpret that however you want. <laughs> yeah. But he is 
the hottest player in Hearthstone right now, and, and quite possibly a streak that we won't see beaten in a long time. I feel like we say that every year because Pavel was doing something like that. And, and then Firebat, like Fire, well, Firebat and Life Coach had like really dominant yeah. streaks as well, and, you know, and of course uh, Colento of, before all of them. But it's so interesting to see Hunter Ace and, and see what he's going to bring to the table because he's also changing it up. But Europe, I just want to see who comes from Europe. Like in terms of just previewing region by region, yeah. who's going to make it out on top? Because in my opinion, this is a gauntlet of what could possibly be the world champion. If you can only catch one playoffs, which is a travesty in itself, but if you only can catch one, most people will say to watch Europe because they set the pace for other regions to follow. They take a lot of risks, and some of them take conservative um, conservative lines. But you also see a bunch of different names, and you're like, wow, I can't believe I haven't heard of this player. But you look at the resume, you're like, of course, this guy's been uh, you know, grinding it out, and he's been doing really well for many years. And I feel like we just say that every time we have a top four come out from Europe for the yeah. championships. Maybe this time we'll get all four players that are known that haven't been grinding for a long time. That's right. I mean, maybe we'll last get a, season. We'll repeat. And it'll just be the same four qualifiers again. Last season was, like, quote, relatively more obscure, but they even all qualified for the ACT championships in 2016. Yeah, it was like a redemption And then AA story. got to the finals. Yeah. So, you know, great stories there for Europe. Can't wait. Uh, in Americas, you know, I think a lot of people are looking at some of the top dogs, but I kind of want to see um, some of the players who have always been um, kind of the, the the bridesmaid, but never the bride, like like Just Saying Just and Soleil. Saying. Like yeah. these two guys have been, you know, always killing it, always doing really well, always like stacking up the points, but never truly getting like the recognition of just being on top of their region because they're overshadowed by people who perform better, like Muzzy, Amnesiac, yeah. Firebat, etc. Um, I want to see the Latin America come back again in full force because I think uh, Brazil um, has just been on the rise for a long time. HGG shows their good performance. Race and Perna and now get down and all these other guys from that region, even PNC, PNC from yeah. Argentina. All of them are doing so well, and I really think um, that they're going to kill it. And I do want to call out one person, too, uh, to pay attention to. This is something I'm excited for. Okay. Firebat is back, and he's qualified for playoffs. There and, he is. And when Firebat 27 is motivated. 27 points. When, I, when Firebat's motivated, he's one of the scariest players out there. The problem is that he does literally everything now. He streams. He creates content. He makes tournaments. He goes to Fireside, supports his local scene. He does Omnistone with me. He uh, He's also casting. So, and, he, and then he's like, yeah, maybe I'll compete as well on the side. So, you know, this guy is literally doing it all in Hearthstone outside of making cards. And who knows what happens in the future. Maybe he ends up doing something like that in game design. Yeah. Uh, this guy is absolutely five-star talent, triple threat, whatever you want to say. And uh, I think Fire, you guys should watch out for Firebat. Maybe we'll finally have a uh, repeat world champion yeah. for the first time. Firebat really, really comes prepared. But the one thing I want to point out by America is before we start talking about Asia Pacific a little bit is – Muzzy's number one seed, his, the discrepancy of points between him and number two seed, which is just saying, is massive. He was 20 points ahead. <laughs> which is almost enough to qualify him for America's Which is almost again. enough to qualify <laughs> again. Yeah, <laughs> America's was a much lower bar to qualify at 27 points, it looks like, um, with yeah. impact, uh, Pinche, and uh, you know a few other people just barely missing out. So. Yeah. Uh, Dr. J, of course, was also at that cutoff. So it's it's... It's a, still a pretty competitive field, but America's has a lot more proving, I think, to do because I think people are sleeping on them more yeah. than ever. And I think people recognize the top of their region being very good. Of course, Tempo Storm won the season one, uh, season two team standings, and, and Muzzy is doing really well. But mm -hmm. just be careful about who to, uh, who who you're underestimating. And I do also want to – actually, there's another person I want to point out to you, Jay. I'm sorry. I'm cheating a lot. Okay. Uh, I also feel like players who focus on wild only – get a little bit of a bad rap. They think Talking that about they control? own. What? Well, you're just stealing my thunder, <laughs> man. I, th I think people who, who say like, oh, you only play Arena. Oh, you only play Wild. Oh, you only play Tavern Brawl. Oh, you only play solo adventures. Oh, you only oh, play you only solo matches against you Dan. Oh, you only <laughs> practice against the innkeeper. Oh, you, you lost to Illidan in the tutorial and, and Hogger. <laughs> no, some people are actually good at Standard 2, even if that's all they do. So <laughs> I want to say that Control is also a player that you have to watch out for. I think uh, you know he's definitely got a lot right. of the grinding on, out of the way, and I feel like he hasn't had too many opportunities to, to show up. And I think he'll be a great representative to show that wild players can hang, and maybe you should try that format too. Yeah, I remember watching uh, his stream when he was getting coached playing Quest Rogue by killing all day. So I think he's in a he's in good hands. He's in, he's in good hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially since that deck is probably making a comeback, <laughs> especially in America, since sure. it seems to be more popular there. Uh, but then finally, Asia Pacific. Uh, we'll gloss over real quick. Uh, Shaxi again. 
uh, taking number one seed. Shaxi is slaying it. By a lot of points. But, yeah. again, Shaxi still didn't show up when we get to those big stages. So looking looking for him yeah. uh, to uh, kind of have that breakthrough. Of course, we'll be seeing Tom mm -hmm. um, once but again trying to make his way back. I, there's a couple of things to pay attention to for Asia Pacific on my end. One is can Japan continue its momentum? Japan ha ha was the most represented country mm -hmm. from the previous season, and it's just been on a steady incline. They've just been having more dominance uh, over the entire Asia Pacific market for representation. They're hungry. They want it. And every Japanese player, or sorry, every uh, season, a Japanese player has been making it to the playoffs and, and championship stage. Every season, a Japanese player says that they were inspired to play more Hearthstone and by qualify for Jap playoffs by the previous <laughs> Japanese player. <laughs> that's right. So it's they're, they're getting stronger. They're like yeah. multiplying. TJ. Yeah. Um, so that's one. Uh, another thing is uh, some players have actually started transitioning to the APEC region. Tyler from the <laughs> Netherlands has now moved to Vietnam and now will be playing under Asia Pacific. Yeah. And we'll see if whether or not he can you know, play on a field that is supposedly assumed to be easier, but it's not really. There's, it's really deceptive. Asia Pacific still has a lot of killers. So I want to see if Tyler can kind of bring a little bit of that European style to the yeah. Asia field and do really well. It'll be a big test for him, though, and I think it, he's going to have to prove a lot. By making that move, he made a statement. Well, not like an actual statement, but, you know, he, he sort of made a statement saying that I feel like my chances of qualifying are better in this region. And I also want to point out that he would have qualified for Europe still. He didn't take it easy. He still got 46 points, yeah, which would have put him still in qualification for Europe. But uh, I, I think it's going to be tougher than maybe he anticipated mm -hmm. uh, uh, when he when he made that move. But who knows? Yeah, um, for sure. Uh, we'll see. But he's definitely a player to watch out for. Um and then yeah. I want to uh, say one last thing about Asia Pacific, which is some players we haven't seen in a while um, who they sometimes are in the spotlight, but they, they we don't have we haven't heard anything in terms of HCT results in quite some time. And I'm talking about uh, Da Hyo Ni, who made it to the World Championship. We're talking about Chonsu. He mm -hmm. finally you know made it back and climbed his way into the playoffs. Uh, is that Nick Slay th that I see that <laughs> we were in I, saw from I, the past? I was just about to. But I'm like, if that's uh, Nick Slay from 2016, uh, he's back. So it's we've got some old faces kind of coming back to the mix of the new players that we've seen, some players who have never left and been here for the entire time. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be really exciting, TJ, to see Lit. how Asia Pacific. And we don't call it, you know, wacky, a packy for no reason. Yeah. I, I think they're going to bring some really fun stuff, especially if Daihoni's in the mix. I want to get him on stream because he's going to be playing some weird stuff. He played, like, Quest Warlock at the Invitational and won yep. the Invitational, along with, uh, you know, his other buddies, Rigurdwins and uh, Rini Hour. And I think Korea is still the number one country to look out for in APAC, but for how long? That's, I mean, APAC is becoming more and more interesting to me with every passing season. I can't wait. Yeah. Should be fun. Starts in a couple days, yeah. uh, at least for Europe. So make sure you guys tune in because yeah. uh, I love playoff season. My favorite season. Actually, yeah. are, so you, are you – so TJ's, you know, most important life moments are like, you know, first BlizzCon. No, Number baby's three. at the top, and then everything oh, else. Okay, I, he, he baby, cut me off at the punchline. I'm like, baby, it's like you know, BlizzCon, first BlizzCon, baby being born, playoffs, and then playoffs. Yeah, <laughs> we're killing all day qualifying. TJ, baby and marriage, killing all day, marriage qualifying up there too. for a world championship, becoming the year of killing all day. Film yeah. prophecy, your son being born. My son, hands down. All right, okay. But killing all day is kind of my second son. That's what I was about to say. Like, so you he's had an opportunity a, to combine he's, both he's the like hands a, here. He's like a close second. <laughs> um. Well, I'm sure the legal guardian transfer papers will, uh, Actually, will when, be underway. Actually, when my actual son wins a world championship, inevitably, in yeah. Hearthstone, that's going to be number Did one. Did you name your son David? No, it's Oliver. Oh, okay. I just, may maybe it was his middle name. I named it David Acosta Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver David Killen all day Acosta <laughs> Sanders. That's right. <laughs> From the house of death. My wife didn't look at the birth certificate, <laughs> luckily. <laughs> Oh no! I see that Fung actually missed playoffs by one point. So we were kind of talking, uh, talking about like, "Oh, Fung, he made a great play, blah blah,", blah and he did really well in uh, in HCT Buenos Aires. One point, but ah, I mean, ah, Fung. <laughs> that's that's kind of the nature of playoffs, man. Like, uh, it's it's really brutal, and that's why you guys can't miss it. It's so exciting because there's heartbreak, but there's also you know so much uh, payoff for players that do make it, and it's really exciting. Dan, hit me with a promo. Uh, hit me with a promo. Okay. Watch this. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Hearthstone Championship Tours. Next stop in Seoul, South Korea. Oh! Teams 
in Hearthstone are more important than ever, even in an individual game like Hearthstone. Muzzy, Amnesiac, and I are on the same team. Muzzy crushes North America. He's been the point leader for two years in a row already. He's not going to get third year in a row without a fight. We're back with Talkstone, and uh, for this last part of the show, we're going to have a special guest, Alex Charsky, in the house. Alex, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me here. Big fan of uh, Hearthstone. That's awesome. And, sorry, Talkstone. <laughs> and Hearthstone. And, and Hearthstone, obviously. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so we all love Hearthstone. Yeah. Uh, Glad we got that out of the way. Alex, yeah, why, don't yeah. you, why don't you introduce yourself formally to people who uh, aren't familiar with who you are? Uh, hey, everyone. I am Alex Charsky. I'm a product manager on Hearthstone, and primarily my role is uh, tournament operations. So everything, uh, every Hearthstone tournament uh, either goes through my team or through me, and I usually am the one responsible for it. So all those bad tournament experience you've had, I'm the one to blame. <laughs> I was about to say, man, I'm like, well, what's your email? What's your Twitter? What's your mailing address? So, uh, you know, everyone can direct At their Alex fury. Alex Charsky on Twitter. <laughs> and uh, Alex is oh, for, wow. He, Alex is like all behind the scenes. He he doesn't do like camera stuff or, yeah, or yeah, press yeah. stuff. So you can tell he's very nervous. He's <laughs> nervous. <laughs> so I'm going to sit here and just try and make him as uncomfortable as possible as Dan grills him about playoffs. Yeah. Yeah. Until Admiral Bull gets right. here, you're the guy he makes them comfortable. <laughs> as oh, as possible. <laughs> um, Alex, what, what are you playing in Hearthstone these days? You know, just uh, a lot of puzzles. Yeah, the puzzle I, lab. But I heard, uh, yeah, I heard you have to be uh, smart. So <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not super smart about. <laughs> I, I about I've the been uh, I have I've been holding off on it because I've been doing it as a group project on Omnistone with Kibler and Firebat. So we kind of like agreed not to play it with each other until we go into the podcast. So don't spoil anything oh, for fun. me. But it sounds yeah. really fun. I think the puzzle labs are generally yeah, been a yeah, pretty big, big hit. Big fan. Yeah, I've just been grinding out puzzles for the last couple of days. It's been very engaging. They gave us play tests for the puzzles a while ago when they were like prototyping. Oh them. yeah, that was really fun. And the, those the play tests were easy. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, they, they well they were hard. Up. They were hard for like for for us. We sat there you know around <laughs> one person's monitor, like five of us trying to figure out one of the easy puzzles. How many and that was like a level one puzzle, puzzle. <laughs> yeah. 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 implemented into the game. And so uh, yeah, <laughs> do love the puzzles. <laughs> yeah. Killing it. Yeah, I think Thursday mornings when those play tests come out is one of my most um, exciting times in the office. Dope. Uh, we just so get to hang around and see the previews of what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah, that's great, man. That's great. So, uh, you know, I'm glad you when you're not solving the puzzles of how to make Swiss rounds, you're solving oh, puzzles man. in Hearthstone. Those Boom! puzzles are fun too. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. It's like you're just obsessed with Swiss uh, round tr- puzzles. the most complicated things ever. Yeah. So, uh, Alex, talk to us about uh, playoffs. Like, you know, what's it like planning it behind the scenes? It's, in my opinion, we kind of talked about this with TJ, uh, and you were sitting five feet from me, so I'll say it again. Uh, I think it's one of the the largest undertakings in the industry because you're you have so many different locations linked up playing in one giant bracket and you're all broadcasting from them with different languages and regions and internet speeds and man and, and people who you know who come from different countries like people aren't from the countries that they're attending to so it's 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 crazy so talk to me about like what's it like preparing for it planning it and uh, how do you how do you actually you know muster the energy to stay awake during all these crazy <laughs> well hours? that's a different story itself <laughs> Uh, but yeah, uh, I mean, playoffs is probably one of our most complex problems uh, or programs to to puzzles. sort of solve puzzles to solve. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's it's really complicated because it's it's a tournament that's both uh, uh, a LAN and an online tournament. Um, so the challenge there is how do we get everyone to show up to these six to eight locations and uh, coordinate everything across different time zones, even for each individual yeah. playoffs. Um, we, we have three or four different time zones, people showing up at different times of the day, staying up super late. Uh, so we, we usually do this with six to eight locations. Uh, and, uh, you know, planning begins as, as early as a year in advance where really? we... Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. So you're planning for 2019 venues right now, yeah. like <clears throat> the second season, because that's yes. where we're in the second season. Yeah, well, one of the biggest wow. challenges for us is that is that we, we have to sign these locations pretty early on. Okay. Uh, and... Uh, over the years, we sort of learned that we have to be pretty stringent on our requirements mm-hmm. for uh, for internet connection speeds, other specifications, yeah. seating. So these locations can can host uh, you know as little as four players or as many as fifty. So we have to account for that, and we don't quite know who's going to qualify. And sometimes it's surprising who does and doesn't qualify, as you guys already know. Right, it's previous a moving segments. target for some of these people. So you, yeah. some vi- like venues you can plan like okay maybe like five to ten people and then it's like turns out 25 people yeah. in Germany yeah. qualify you're like oh man I don't know if they yeah. all fit in that spot and and we, we 
we, we try to control this, and obviously we know who, who will likely qualify and who will qualify a little bit before playoffs happens. But uh, it, it, And we, we staff appropriately, so one of the things that we do with each venue is we, we contract them to, to ensure that they have tournament admin staff that speak the local language and, and in general um, sort of look after the players who are at that specific venues. Mm -hmm. And the venue admins, um, w one of the challenges is that how do we get them all talking to each other? Uh, and one of the things we do is that we, we, we also provide a staff of, of um, broadcast admins, uh, people who sit actually with all the broadcast staff with, with you guys in, 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 in the room, actually uh, right next door to you guys when you guys are off air. We walk through it sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Walk it's pretty through. intense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's, it's They it's are very stressed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they are. And they, uh, they, and they do not want to deal with our sassiness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and their job is difficult, right? Like they, they are looking after multiple... Uh, multiple venues and they're communicating with with um, with venue admins whose English might be as a second language uh, and right. in general are fairly stressed uh, and are trying to move this tournament along it takes a lot of coordination for us to to fire off pairings and then make make sure that every every person is is, is sort of gets to their seat as quickly as possible begins their match so that we don't hold up the tournament uh, at, at the same time we're taking all of the uh, broadcast matches and we're, we're moving them to right to um, to their stations and getting them mm -hmm. getting them playing and recording them yeah and uh, recording in them. case we need backup options mm -hmm. for Swiss rounds that's right mm -hmm. and of course they're in different lo they're in different languages so you're like hey you uh, hold on like what deck are you gonna play like so that we can get ready for the broadcast it's it's crazy it's a lot of moving parts what can you tell us a, a horror story perhaps maybe not necessarily something that's like where everything went aflame but you know like, obviously don't share too much that you get <laughs> fired or implicated but you know is there a All funny good. story a funny All story a horror story yeah. something uh, you share? I, I mean. Our goal is to to obviously make sure the players have a um, a fair and competitive environment to mm -hmm. to to play in. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes we fall short, and sometimes uh, not everyone has a great experience. Uh, at last playoffs, we had a player who uh, who was instructed to go play on uh, one of our PCs, one of our hardware, and unfortunately, the hard uh, we had a malfunction on the hardware, and, oh, no. uh, and 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 it cost the player the game. And and this is this is one of the things that obviously like keeps me up at night of like how do we prevent these these problems from happening and how, what do we do to recover these things from these things uh, so one, one of the policies that we changed for, for this upcoming playoffs is that uh, we're no longer going to require un, uh, none of the players will be required to play on, on our hardware even if they're on the stream uh, we will only use that PC for streaming and we'll give them the option to always use their, their hardware that they bring to and they probably play millions of Hearthstone matches on and right. no ins and outs of Man, I mean, I I don't uh, I don't envy you at all yeah, or your yeah, job. Yeah, like that's that's uh, that's a thing that like I get that call, uh, and some sometimes that that call is like a three in the morning, right? Like we run right. we run uh, uh, Europe playoffs on on U.S. time, so the time difference keeps us up, yeah. you know, at three o'clock in the morning. And that's mm -hmm. that's a decision you have to make on you know staying up, um, you know, till three or five in the morning. And like I got to make this call, and <laughs> it falls on me. And you know, we we try to do the best we can, and we we, we certainly discuss these things and. Uh, we learn from from every every mistake and every incident, and we we try to make the the experience better for the players. Playoffs is actually good preparation for a baby, and I just <laughs> have my baby. Alex there actually has oh, everything right, yeah. about Alex has baby, a baby yeah. doing two months. <laughs> two months. Two months. Oh, congratulations! Yeah, you. yeah. So you're allowed to talk about babies. Yeah, this that's guy. Right. No, we've we've been comparing notes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, you guys can be buddies. So yeah. I'm a first time father. I'm expecting him to. Maybe not come to you with questions, but at least to, yeah. to share. Yeah. So share I'm stories happy to learn from like anyone. Any, you know. you, anyone. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> <can> <laughs> <teach> <laughs> me. I am anyone. Yeah, I mean, if you can handle, you know, 64 plus babies at one time, why can't you handle <laughs> one baby? <laughs> should be, should we be shouldn't easy. keep down the show. Having a baby is down. nothing compared to organizing and executing <laughs> three playoffs in three weeks back, <laughs> three times a year. All right, okay. <clears throat> Getting back on track here, I do want to give a big shout out to all the admins and stuff. They do a really good yeah, job in, awesome. in synchronizing across everything. And of course, uh, you know the experience of an admin, you know, is is definitely <laughs> kind of uh, tough. Um, one thing that I noticed too is that at these venues, a lot of them do happen to be local points for firesides, for example. Uh, is that kind of part of your plan too to help some of these locations crux the local scenes of wherever they are? Uh, mostly, uh, although recently we've been we've been sort of trying to focus on the playoff experience first and foremost. Uh, it it can never come at the cost. Uh, like adding additional tournaments to um, to the spot to um, each of the playoff venues can never come at a cost of of a degrading the experience for playoffs themselves. Yeah. Uh, and and whether that you know th this is my advice to to the regional teams is that yeah you can totally have a ton of um, other options and and have 
um, live audiences and open venues for anyone to attend and participate in in smaller side events. But please, please make sure that you are never taking away staff from playoffs. You are never bottlenecking the internet connection of your venue um, at uh, sort of at the cost of, of scaling um, to yeah to larger uh, offerings for, for players. At least, you know, uh, make sure that most of the legwork gets done. I've seen people, for example, at uh, the playoffs qualify, like it's only like one or two players left in the venue and they're playing their last match. They're like the last match for the entire stream. So after the, you see people like celebrating and partying with them, I yeah. think that's like a really fun environment for some of those players who like finally get over that hump, especially if they've been trying for many years. Definitely really cool. So definitely work hard and then yeah. <laughs> maybe let loose a little bit later. Yeah. Um, and, and those life experiences are super, super important, right? Like you yeah. guys know, like, Whenever there's a crowd watching your match, you're just way more energized, and it means a lot more to win. And and uh, you, you know, playoffs are super competitive, and we have the utmost respect for people that they can manage this and, and manage to qualify. Because you know, I certainly can't. That's why I administrate things is that I can't play at that level. Sure. I sure. qualified for playoffs once. Did you? Is that true? I did. 2016 summer. Awesome. Huh? I cast it instead. <laughs> I turned it down. Wow. But. I could have. That was very generous of you, TJ, to let other people. I could have been a world champion. That's right. But I chose not to. It could have been you getting babbling booked. It could have. <laughs> it could have. Yeah. And I'd like to think that I would have won. <laughs> uh, Alex, I think everyone can agree year over year, uh, Blizzard's making big changes, um, especially to playoffs and you know how it kind of feeds into it from heroes, the tavern heroes, or the qualifying system to the points and system structure. Um, and I think a lot of people understand that, you know, there's been a progression of everything that you've learned. So what are some of the most important things that you've learned so far in 2018's campaign? Because, it's, you know, obviously everything is still being worked on because it's the first year doing Masters. Team standings. Uh, playoffs against get, once again gets a fl- facelift. How we do ch- uh, championships. Even the scheduling itself around the um, expansion releases. So what are some of the, the huge points that, you know, y- you guys can talk about that you've learned so far? Well, I, I first just want to say that I think the only thing that's been consistent about Hearthstone uh, esports is the fact that it, it's constantly changing. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, true, it, it, it is very true, and, and that's that, that's really um, out of desire to just continue to to try to improve. So we we always look at these things as as um, as holistically as possible, and and um, try to figure out what we're what we're doing wrong and how we can better serve the players. Uh, and I think a lot of these conversations. Um, right now revolve around of how do we reward consistency mm-hmm. and, and and i think we're, we're, we're now seeing some of these things come to fruition obviously it takes a while we just want to have as many opportunities for people to to enjoy playing competitive hearthstone and uh travel around the world meet their closest group of friends of 300 people or more and uh <laughs> and, and play matches against them and, and reward those that do consistently well sure and meet <clears throat> their favorite casters as and, well that's right 300 of their yeah. favorite casters <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, which 295 me. of them are British. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that does uh, seem to be the percentage. I mean, I guess we can end it on a positive note, too, for this <laughs> line of questioning, interrogation, Alex. Uh, do you feel like you've hit that consistency? Look at Hunter Ace, man. And, and of course, people know what to expect from Muzzy and even guys like Shaxi. Um, are you guys floored by that level of consistency that it's, been able to hit? It's incredible to see what, what some of these guys are doing. And my, my background is traditional card games, and I obviously know that – you, you know, like win win rates in, in card games, like 60%, 70%, you are considered one of the best players in the world. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that translates to, you know, you lose one out of every four games. So uh, e- even though that, that happens, uh, y- you know, we, we, we mad respect for people that can pull off uh, win rates like the, uh, you know, Hunter Ace has mm-hmm. or Muzzy has um, at, at these international uh, competitions. And I just want to. That was kinda, very wholesome. It was, yeah. I just want to kind of sum up a little bit because I'm in a unique position where I had a lot of outside perspective, and now I have a mix of inside perspective since I work on the Hearthstone esports team. Uh, Alex is the guy that actually sits the closest to me uh, in our pod. He sits like right, yeah, be, yeah, right behind me, physically. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I talked to him probably the most out of you know anybody on the team, and also I still because I'm a, uh, a talent, a caster, I still get that outside perspective, and just seeing how smooth things have gotten over the years and seeing kind of what it takes inside and then seeing that come into fruition outside uh, as a caster and everything come together. Just seeing that room that we talked about earlier with all the admins sitting in there 
um, working constantly for 12, 14 hours uh, with breaks. You know, we do have enough admin staff to, to give them breaks. But sometimes. Sometimes. Um, it, but it's very cool to see the progression of playoffs. And uh, I'm just excited now that we have Alex and, and more staff on the Hearthstone Esports team uh, that are dedicated to uh, tournament administration operations uh, where we can go uh, in, in the future. Yeah. So TJ's got the full perspective as a caster, as a guy working on the Blizzard Esports team, and as the 2016 should have been. <laughs> should have been <laughs> world champion. That's right, Dan. That's right. Thank yeah. you so much. All right, Alex, before we let you go, would you like to play a game? Yes. More specifically... Would you like to buy this deck? That's right. My uh, my lovely assistant, TJ <laughs> Sanders, uh, is going to propose a deck idea to you. And uh, we just want to see if you can kind of land around it, you know, uh, give you some clues. Like if we asked you, like, oh, how much dust will this deck cost? See if you can land around that. And if you do, we will buy this deck for you. We we came upon this conclusion TJ because we'll buy this deck for you. I'm wow. such a I'm such a good salesman <laughs> that every week everybody just buys my deck instantly. They bought it last week without you. They bought it last week without me. That's right. And you know what, Alex? I'm sick of it. Yeah. So I'm going to make people work to buy my deck. <laughs> I think I could have been one of your guests that <laughs> what, would so not the, have the, the uh, question, bought your deck. The question, Alex, now becomes: Will we let you buy? This <laughs> will deck? we let you? <laughs> oh, okay. Buy this deck. <laughs> We're just going to spice it up a little bit. Uh, so TJ, what do we have this week? Just give just give the name of the defining <laughs> type of card. Um, so the name of the deck, yes. um, where I got it from on Hearthpone, with a few changes. <laughs> on Hearthpone, where all great <laughs> top tier decks come from. Is here comes the boom. Okay, so okay. can you guess a couple of cards that are in it, Alex? Can uh, you guess don't, three cards? Don't make me guess the cards on there. <laughs> 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 I have not been paying much attention to this expansion. We've been we've been sort of heads down for. Uh, for 2019 planning, 2020 planning, and uh, y y you know it's, it's been a while since I've, I've opened up the the old uh, card collection and he's lining up the excuses. <laughs> uh, here we go. All right, can we get what in fact? Glasses? In fact, one of the conversations I usually have with TJ is like, TJ, please give me deck codes of the most successful decks <laughs> so that I can keep playing. All well, right, have, you know, rank well, 20. Boy, do I have a deck code for you. Well, Doctor Boom is in this deck. Doctor Boom, here comes yeah. the Boom. So which I means it is, a, it is a warrior deck. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so your your Doctor Boom, Mad Genius, Warrior Hero card. And this is an OTK deck. Okay. You kill your opponent in a single turn. Can you potentially guess what a warrior could do to kill their opponent with a single hit? Thirty plus damage. Uh, I I really can't, Dan. I mean, Dan? Does it have to do something with this hero power? Which hero power? The Ragnaros hero power. That's right. So it is a quest Ooh. warrior. Ooh, hero for two. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ten out of ten. We'll just buy right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Quest warrior. Wow. Really good deck, turns out. I don't know if we're going to let you buy this deck anymore. TJ, this sounds right. just like a regular good ladder deck. People do play quest warrior on ladder. They do, but can they kill their opponent in a single turn? That's right. What is the OTK? It involves uh, Clockwork Automaton. Clockwork Automaton and Galvanizer. Galvanizer reduces the cost what? of your mechs in your hand by one, and Clockwork Automaton, which doubles the damage and healing of your hero power, it's a mech. is a mech. Oh. It costs five. So you get both your Clockwork Automatons, you reduce them by one to four mana each with the Galvanizer. So you have okay. two Clockwork Automatons that cost four mana, and then you have two mana left perfectly to be able to press your hero power button and deal 32 damage to your opponent because they stack 8 damage, 16 damage, 32 damage. Now your opponent needs to have nothing on the board and you need to have survived long enough and not killed your opponent already with hero powers. Well, that's why we played Dr. Boom. That's why we, we played, played Dr. Do Boom, hold on to Sulfurious, yeah. wait for the right perfect moment, and then kill him in one turn. Here's the kicker. This is what makes the deck really unique. And Less competitive. And less competitive. <laughs> I gather. <laughs> I don't run many taunts at all. Oh. oh. That means I'll complete my quest later on in the game, so it'll make it tougher, and I won't have killed my opponent quick enough so I can still do my OTK. How do you not lose? You have a lot do more Do you know removal? what class we're playing? Do you know how much armor we gain? I have executes. I have war paths. I have weapons. I have taunts. I have blood razors. I have brawls. I have Dr. Boom. I have Lich King. I have giggling inventors. Ooh. 
Except which actually doesn't work with the quest. It doesn't progress the quest, but it's just such a good card I had to put it in. That's right. Unless the quest rogues vanish you, and then... And you then... Can, you can play... The, or uh, Psychic Scream. Then you have two ooh. more Anoyotrons in your deck. That's right. Would you buy this deck? No. <laughs> Wow! Wow! Let's think. Wait, hold on. Let's 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 explain wait, wait, this a little on. bit more. So uh, back up, Alex. Conceptually, <laughs> you don't need to kill them in one turn. It's a backup option. There All are right. some decks out there, for example, like Mechathune Warlock, that like there's an even Mechathune Warlock that just use Mechathune in case everything goes wrong. Their Mountain Giants get answered. Their Blood River Golden doesn't do anything. Their Twilight Drakes get killed, and they're like, well, you know what? Just in case Mechathune, if, if I get to the fatigue stage, I can use as a backup win condition. So you play normal control warrior, but you use the quest in case you need it. In case. What do you think? What do you think? So in, it's not OTK warrior. It's OTK just in case warrior. <laughs> seems, K for case. Seems too complicated. <laughs> would you buy this deck? I would not. Okay. Actually, before you answer that question, Dan, would we let him buy this deck? No. No. <laughs> we don't want you to buy it. Fair enough. Yeah. So before you quit, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> Which, what do you think is harder, to win a game with this deck or to run – a successful playoffs with no errors. I, th I think for me, I, I I know the answer for me. Yeah, uh, that's that's the one with the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All, All right. right. Well, Alex, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Talkstone. You don't really uh, public face very much, huh? So usually we ask the guests like, where we're gonna see you next, but is there gonna uh, be the next time we see you? Yeah, I'm taking a break in the middle of playoffs and going to Montreal for the tour stop. So hope oh, to see some awesome. people there. I thought you were gonna be like, "Well, I'm taking a break because you know I'm getting ready for the birth of my child." Then I'm like, taking a break. Okay. In a couple yeah. months, right? Yeah, in a couple months. Yeah. And then uh, maybe back for the following playoffs. Then by then, oh, hopefully yeah. everything. Uh, yeah, goes and champs. Well. Knock on wood. Uh, DJ, it's been good to have you back. It's just like old times, man. Yeah. Playoffs this weekend. I'm I'm not fully back yet. Uh, I'm still I'm gonna be casting playoffs. Yeah, uh, that's for sure. Okay, but so to contextualize this, remember how I was gonna make a joke that you know TJ's you know BlizzCon, then the birth of his son, then playoffs. <laughs> TJ's coming back early <laughs> from his paternity leave to cast playoffs. Yeah, Reluctantly. that was part of the building of the joke. You're gonna tell me that you don't think playoffs is hype. You, I know how much it means to you, TJ. Yeah, I, I do like playoffs. I, you know, I talked about it with my wife a lot, and yeah. she said that. You know, should be fine with it. I'm trying to help more now so that I, w I won't be, like, working during the week. So I'll be mm -hmm. casting playoffs and going right back home. Then casting playoffs going right back home. Yeah. Um, and, like, coming as late as I possibly can uh, to make sure. Uh, but uh, I will be casting playoffs. But I won't be fully back in the swing of things for, you know, another, you know, three or four weeks. But That's right. uh, you will see me at playoffs. But probably just um, baby pictures on Twitter until then. And in between, yeah, and all get that stuff. Get those mute buttons ready if you can't yeah. handle them, or get the like buttons ready if you're really down for that. Yeah, paternity leave is fun. I just sit there and feed my son while I binge watch Glee on Netflix. <laughs> we didn't ask you. Where are we gonna see you next? Uh, I'll be casting a playoffs as well with uh, Derek Brown. It'll be really fun. I actually haven't really casted much with Derek, so it'll be interesting. And he has some pretty big shoes to fill. Brian Kibler won't be there because it is brutal to cast here at Time Zone. Yeah. And why not bring you know more people from Europe? He's, a, he's been doing a great job. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll be casting playoffs. And then I'll be back next week with more talks. So, TJ, we're going to do some fall playoff specials. We're going to do it every week. That's right. Do we know who our next guest is? We're going to have some HCT casters. So I'm, right. go I'm going to not spoil it yet. Okay, okay. Uh, but we're going to have some of the cash. We're going to bring them down, and we're going to just completely unbox playoffs. It's Surprise. It's yeah. me and TJ. Again. <laughs> 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 all right. Well, uh, that's all the time that we have for today uh, for this episode of Talkstone. Uh, as mentioned, next week we're also going to be doing Talkstone special for the fall playoffs. Normally it's every other week at 6 p.m. Pacific. But, again, same time same place next week, twitch.tv slash play Hearthstone. If you guys want the audio version of this podcast, check us out at SoundCloud, iTunes, and Google Play. And of course, if you guys want anything, whether it's news, articles, analysis, and more related to competitive Hearthstone, go to playhearthstone.com slash esports. We'll see you next time in the tavern.